is. Anyway. All right. It is four o'clock. So yep. I'm going to say we're getting started. And I'm going to start off by thanking the Evergreen Community Development Initiative and Mobius for helping fund the conference. They are our conference sponsors. And I want everybody to make sure that they feel well loved because we need money to do things like this. And thank you. So right. I'm now going to hand it over to Andrea and Ruth for it's a feature, not a bug. New feature highlights in 3.6 and 3.7. All right. Okay. And I have shared my screen. So welcome, everybody. Uh, to It's a Feature, Not a Bug. I'm Andrea Nyman from Equinox Open Library Initiative, where I am the Development Project Manager. And with me is my longtime friend and colleague, Ruth Frazier, from Evergreen Community Development Initiative and in Evergreen, Indiana. And we're going to talk to you about the new features in 3.6 and 3.7. This isn't going to be completely comprehensive. There is a lot of like really cool stuff that went into both of these releases. So we're going to try to hit what we can and, um, you know, Hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions. So here is our outline. Um, in years past, when I've done this presentation, we've usually grouped it into like this. These are the features in this release, and these are the features in this other release. Well, this year, we decided to be the librarians that we are and classify things. So uh, we're going to talk about first OPAC features. Then we're going to talk about some Angular features. Um, then a few miscellaneous quality of life improvements. Then the course materials module, which gets its very own section. And then, uh, of course, we're going to give credit to all of our community uh, funders and developers who sponsored all this great work and created all this great work. And then we'll give you some time for Q&A. And there's also going to be a slide at the very end with some links to things like documentation and release notes if you want to read more. So without further ado, uh, OPAC features. So. Uh, I like made a list of who's going to talk about things, but I didn't actually share it with Andrea. It's so. true. This is all true. <laughs> <laughs> it's on our document. Uh, I think in the, the program description, it says the Ruth and Andrea show, and this is part of it. Um, also, in keeping with the uh, categorization and classification that librarians do, please know that because we do not actually have a standards body for this uh, presentation, it's kind of arbitrary other than that. So there's a little bit more going in there. The first thing that we're going to talk about is the Boo Pack. And yes, that is how we're going to be referring to it as often as we can, although it is the Bootstrap OPAC using the Bootstrap Toolkit. Uh, this was done at least in the beginning stages by Chris Burton from Niagara Falls Public Library and also for LINK, which is the consortium that I believe that they're associated with. And it was to make a more responsive uh, mobile first OPAC. And so you can see here, there are definitely calls back to the uh, template toolkit OPAC that we know and love. And then you can also see it as it looks on a mobile screen, which is a little bit uh, handier for our patrons, hopefully. Next. And now, this is one of my favorite features of this is the um, condensed and maybe simplified-ish. It looks nicer for the My Account feature of the OPAC and something as somebody, especially if we're talking about using a mobile device where we can actually get at those things and we don't have all the rendering issues that the TPAC has on mobile devices, little teeny print, et cetera. I'm also watching chat while you guys are like singing Boo Pack songs. So anything else you want to say about the Bootstrap OPAC? I mean, we could talk, this could be an entire session. It really um, could. Because um, so much work went into it by so many people. Yeah. But definitely a huge shout out to Chris for getting the ball rolling on this and doing the uh, investigative work as far as um, bootstrap yep. development and goes and all of that. Yeah, it's just generally it's it's as Ruth noted, it's uh, more responsive. It's um, because and it's also more uh, accessible and it just looks so much nicer um, and more modern than than the old T-Pack, which has is has 
been venerable and served us low these many years, but come on, like, I mean, it's I mean, you remember the presentation in 2012 about transitioning to the TPAC from what oh, was yeah. it before the JSPAC, JPAC? Yeah, was that Shay and Mike? Anyway. I don't know. Is this something you can just turn on? So this is, uh, it actually becomes the default OPAC. It's not in 3.6, um, but I, is it in 3.7 it becomes the default, default OPAC? It, in 3.7, it's the default. In 3.6, it's uh, available, but you have to, it, you can't use both. You have to pick one and your system administrator uh, has to configure it. So it's you're either using the boo pack or you're using the TPAC, but uh, you cannot use both. So. Okay, so let's let's move on to Did You Mean? This is a um, thing that was sponsored by the Evergreen Community Development Initiative, developed by Mike Rylander at Equinox, and it is part of the 3.7 release. This is the first stage of this um, OPAC search enhancement that gives suggestions, as you can see in here, for one word, one class searches. Um, that probably seems a little bit primitive at the beginning, knowing that there are some other stages to this to build on this first foundational thing. So, uh, Andrea, you have some more to say about that, I think. Yeah, so there is an outline to add more uh, more searches and more classes. Um, we're actually currently Equinox is working for ECDI um, on producing specs for the next piece of this, which is going to be multi-word uh, single class searching. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we're going to kind of build on it from there at other later stages include cross class uh, as well as uh, DIY thesauri so you can build your own uh, their interface to build your own uh, thesaurus uh, swaps and suggestions and things like that. So this first stage built the infrastructure that the later stages will use um, as well as providing the public interface ability for those single word uh, single class suggestions. There's a whole bunch of uh, library settings as well to go to govern this um, and, and its sensitivity. So what the screenshot shows is we have told this test system to show three suggestions. Um, and then you can configure it in this case to show suggestions if you only have a certain number of search hits or if you only have zero hits or whatever. So this one's obviously showing them for there's hits there, but it's saying, hey, we, we found in the in the data set. And that's an important key here is that these are not just suggestions based on a random dictionary. This is actually making suggestions based on your bibliographic data. So any of those did you mean suggestions, um, when you click them, it's not gonna be like, oh, ha ha, just kidding, there's no results here. Any of those suggestions when you click will actually result in hits. So that is a, a key feature of this that I think makes it much cooler than a lot of general search suggestion features. And this is, this is going to become a um, more in-depth topic in future conferences for sure. Uh, there will continue to be sessions and things about that because this is a pretty uh, technical aspect as far as weighting searches, deciding um, how you're going to do that. And uh, it, it's an additional skill set uh, for administering Evergreen. The other thing I will say about this is this was the first thing, at least that I've participating that was a thing that was developed specifically toward the boo pack and then ended up being ported back ported into the TPAC. But we, we went out on a limb before we actually knew that the bootstrap OPAC was going to be the thing. And we're super happy that <laughs> it went the way that it did. Even though sadly my screen is from the TPAC. Yeah, but, well, you know, it is. I promise it's available yeah. in, in the boo pack. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Onward. Onward. This is super cool. Um, and it's going to be something that I fully anticipate that you will be talking up to your librarians. And yeah. Well, I'm going to say librarians, anybody that works at the library, this, these are hold groups and it uses a modified uh, patron or user bucket to place a large number of holds for anybody that's in that bucket. You can access it here through the circulation 
menu and then I'm going to go on to the next. It opens up this, uh, this modified bucket where you then click on the button and um, create the bucket. And then from patron search, you can add people to the bucket. And then I think the next screen is going to show the event. So one of the things about this is also kind of, I don't want to say first stage for this. This There are a couple ways that you can um, place these holds. So this is directly from that um, hold group bucket. I keep calling it a bucket. This is a little... It's, it's, a it special, a it's a special case user bucket. Yeah, but you need to have the um, bib ID for the item. So this is, I don't want to say it's specialized. Somebody's going to ha definitely have to know that they need to get a bib ID first. But then you can also do this from the catalog search um, and select an item there and then select uh, the bucket right there. So. This is a thing that I learned. This does not yet work in the boo pack. Uh, it works in the T pack, but there that's one of the bugs that I, tickets that I need to do is to have this developed to go uh, functionality for the bootstrap O pack. So this one right now is in the T pack. So keep that in mind. Is anyone seeing the bucket? I oh. still see, did you mean? Oh. Yeah, that's Beth. That is a problem that some people have been having in Hopin is they're seeing slide lag. So yeah. I think with some people, they've been able to fix it with a refresh. Um, I've, I've seen reports of that in other rooms, but we are on the holds groups slide. And Ruth, I think there actually might already be a bug for um, OK, yeah, I haven't gone through and checked tickets. I'm sure that there pack. probably is for this one. And this was a feature that was uh, developed also by Mike at Equinox, and uh, it was a community partnership between um, community library at Sunbury, uh, Georgia Pines, Evergreen, Indiana, and the Consortium of Ohio Libraries. Is it available in the new staff catalog? Not yet. Isn't it? That, no, it's not in the staff catalog yet. Oh, I thought it was. Not as far as I tested it. It, it is, you have to go through the traditional catalog if you're in the, that's what I meant to say, that you okay. have to go through Oops. the traditional catalog. Oh no, ah, what am I doing? You shouldn't have let me drive the slides. I should always let you, this is part of the show, man. Okay, hold on, let's get it. What happened to my slides? I was gonna say, do you want mine? But I don't know. Sure. Here, I actually have them open somewhere else too. <laughs> Hey, hey, <laughs> we're back in it. All right, I think we are coming up to GeoSort. <laughs> Do you want GeoSort? You want to talk I, about it? Sure, okay. I'd love to talk about GeoSort. All right, GeoSort. So um, this adds uh, a latitude, uh, it adds the ability to sort uh, by geographic distance in the OPAC. So if you were click into uh, a record details page in the OPAC and see all the holdings. You've got a really big consortium. Um, maybe you don't necessarily know off the top of your head where all those locations are. Um, this gives uh, an option to sort those um, using the use default. Uh, you click enter either a zip code or an address and click go, and it'll sort by um, ascending distance. Uh, in this screenshot, you can see it's um, in kilometers. There's a library setting to change that to miles. You can also return it to default item sort this way. And this is calculated by um, adding latitude and longitude fields to the org unit uh, physical address and org unit settings. So you add a latitude and longitude to those, and that's how this is being calculated. Um, it does use a third party service uh, that's available, or third party service that you have to, um, you, outside of Evergreen, I think for the testing purposes, we mostly used uh, Google's GeoCoder API. Um, and I'm not saying that I did this, but I might have done this where I went into Google Maps and got the latitude and longitude for every single library in our consortium. And I have a list of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I was like, oh, I can use somebody's service rather than doing this. Hmm. Yeah. Lessons yeah. learned. But you can actually enter them in yourself. Yes. 
Um, and there's also, to. I think, a button. If you have the geolocation <laughs> service configured, there's a button in, or unit settings where you can just get the coordinates, and then it'll populate them in. Yeah. Um, and fun fact, I have a special hate for geolocation services because I live on a peninsula. Um, on the other side of a large body of water. And it's always like this thing that takes you two hours to drive to is like 15 miles away from you. And I'm like, stop it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so um, that's GeoSort and that's available in 3.7. That was also funded by Evergreen Community Development Initiative and developed at Equinox by Jason Etheridge. So moving right along. All right, single sign-on. This was um, one that uh, was funded by Lynn Benton Community College and BC Co-op. And this one Equinox did uh, as well. And it basically, it gives you an option to uh, affiliate the Evergreen OPAC with an identity provider and therefore use a single sign-on service. So it now uses uh, Shibboleth to authenticate against your external IDP. Uh, if you have the need to use multiple IDPs, uh, you can do that. It makes the configuration a little bit more complicated. You've got to use um, the loc g variable and some Apache settings, but um, it is possible. Um, there are a bunch of different options with this, including you can force everyone to use single sign-on, in which case the, your patrons will be transparently redirected to your SSO login. Um, and if the SSO is optional, patrons will be presented with the screenshot on this slide, which just says, please either use single sign-on or use the OPAC sign-on. There's a question in, in chat. What's an IDP? Yeah, IDP is an identity provider. So that is a, a service like some campuses use a single identity provider that can authenticate their students against uh, a variety of services, um, the independent services. So everyone's kind of the IDP is owned by the campus and then everyone, all the different campus services are talking to that to say, hey, is this a valid user of this service? So this gives the ability for the Evergreen OPAC to make use of those sorts of centralized services. How is this different from pre previous ability to use Shibboleth as an optional IDP? So this is giving you like the full kind of a full scope of control of, of how to, to do it, um, including the ability to uh, do, like I said, you can uh, do optional or forced SSO. You can configure it to sign out automatically or uh, force sign out when you log of the identity provider when you log out of Evergreen. Um, you can configure it on a bunch of different uh, elements within stock Evergreen. I know there were some people in the community using custom uh, setups with Shibboleth, but so this one is is in stock Evergreen. So I'm not sure if that's maybe what you were thinking of. So, um, but it's very cool. And I think it'll be really helpful, especially to academic libraries. Um, now, just to reiterate, this is only for the catalog, um, the public catalog. This is not uh, for the staff side yet. It could be someday with additional work, but this is for the OPAC. Rosemary, does that, does that answer the question rather than it being a, a configured and customized thing that it is now a stock park? Okay. Fantastic. Cool. Awesome. Onward. Uh, I think this is still me. It is. All right. I'll keep talking. But I love lassos, just saying. Lucky you guys. Like lassos. these ones. Library groups as lassos. <laughs> so this is the bug for this was actually named Bringing Lassos Back. Thanks, Mike Rylander. <laughs> and every time I read that bug, I got the song stuck in my head. So when it was actually committed, I dropped a picture in our, our in-house Slack at Equinox where I gave Justin Timberlake a lasso and, you know, captioned it bringing lassos. I don't know why that's not in this presentation. I don't know why that is not in this presentation. That is <laughs> failing on my Mistakes part. have been made already. Mistakes have yeah. been made. Okay. Anyway, but what lassos does, also known as library groups, is that it gives you a way to create searchable groups of libraries regardless of their org unit position. So if you are in a mixed public-private consortium and you want to, uh, or mixed, excuse me, school public library consortium, and you want to group all of, say, your school libraries together and have them all be searched as a unit. Or if you want to have all your law, law libraries together in a mixed academic consortium, you can do that with lassos. Um, you can make these globally visible or only visible at uh, certain member org units. Although we generally recommend global visibility if as a matter of best practice, if you allow all users to search all locations, um, making sure that they can all see all the lassos is gonna be less confusing. 
Um, and then there's been two separate groups, uh, two separate locations, depending on whether you're in basic search or advanced search. So you can see on the basic search page, it's inserted into the library dropdown. And on the advanced search page, it is inserted into the where dropdown, which is where you would otherwise do your search, uh, search scoping options. Mm -hmm. So, and to anticipate a frequently asked question about this, they do not uh, currently have, Lasso does not currently have the ability to influence things like circulation and hold policy, but that is another thing that would certainly be possible uh, with, with additional work in the future. And this one was um, funded by PALES. And I can imagine that there will definitely be, especially for holds, yeah, um, a, a way to. Anyway, yeah, there's a lot of within a consortium. Just, yeah, yeah, there is a lot of places that this could go, but this is just for the search functionality right now. Yep. Okay. And then, um, not to put the short shrift on these, but they're maybe just less less pretty than the others. Not that they're less important, but you know, some things don't don't do well with screenshots. They're kind of um, the things that we assume that are going to be there and they weren't there and now they have been kind of added and everybody's like, oh, that was supposed to be there all along. Yeah, that would make it more of a bug and that goes against the title of our presentation. No. Though. Yeah, but it's not really a bug because the assumption is not correct. I would also like everyone to note, if you hadn't noted already, there is the occasional cicada on our slides. Just, you know, yes. because that's the year Because I love cicadas. Because they're bugs. And anyway. maybe food supply. Anyway, never mind. Maybe a food supply. So a limit to available. This um, adds a checkbox. This is another one that's only available in the, the current OPAC, the template toolkit OPAC, which is what we call the TPAC, um, and is not available in the new Bootstrap OPAC yet. But it adds a checkbox to the holdings view uh, when you're looking at a record uh, in record details that'll only show you the available items. Um, so you just toggle the checkbox, it shows you what's available. You untoggle the checkbox, it shows you items regardless of their state. Um, also in the current TPAC uh, is a read more accordion. So you can configure certain long fields uh, in the record to truncate when they display in the OPAC. And then um, based on however many characters there are in that field, uh, you'll be prompted with a read more uh, toggle that'll toggle to read more, read less, and then expand that uh, block of text to be visible in the OPAC. And then also in 3.7, um, there is a patron opt-in which adds a new user setting um, that'll show a receive overdue and courtesy email checkbox in the patron registration screen. So uh, that is a way to let your patrons uh, affirmatively opt in to receiving um, overdue and courtesy emails. And then you, um, once you've added that, you can, there's a SQL that your administrator can run to update your, your notices to incorporate that. I have a question about that one. Okay. Do you know if that is added to the, um, the patron registration request a library card form? You know, I don't. Okay. I don't actually I'll go, know the I'll go and look later. If anybody knows the answer to that, drop it in the chat. I mean, I'm, I'm going to pull up bug squash real quick. Okay, but you're up next. Oh, never mind then. <laughs> Just it's kidding. Your... I'm not going to go search the internet. Okay, so there has been a ton of um, work done to port existing interfaces to, from um, Dojo. JS to uh, Angular. It, it was Angular JS, and now to Angular. I don't know if it's Angular 8 or if we're talking Angular 10 at this point. We just say Angular. Angular next. Um, and so, some of the major things that at least the ECDI has been working on, when regards to that, have been with the acquisitions interface. It's been a multi-year project, and we were really happy to see in version 3.6, uh, both providers and um, search go into that. Uh, we'll take a look at that, and then we'll kind of run through uh, some of these other things. So for the uh, providers interface, there it, it is an administrative thing, and then also um, in the acquisitions menu, there's some stuff there. This uh, adds a provider search, a filterable grid, and then a new provider, as in create a new provider modal. So go to the next one. 
this is one where I could actually talk a lot about it, but this is, you know, a limited thing. So, so it looks significantly different from the Dojo interfaces. Um, and yes, thank you, Jeremy, for putting that in here. I'm kind of using some jargon and I do apologize for that. Uh, this is hopefully uh, more user friendly than it was previously. It's added some functionality in terms of the filters and things like that to set up acquisitions providers. Acquisitions is one of those, um, I'm gonna call it tech services functions that that is um, a foundational workflow in a lot of libraries that doesn't get as much attention as it necessarily should, but it really drives the collection uh, development and, and management in a lot of places. So next slide, please. Unless, in the, then this is the uh, new provider modal that was created for that uh, with all of the cool things required fit fields and et cetera to get those things set up. Rogan, Dojo is like that ex whose stuff you keep finding around your house even after you've split long ago. I don't want to talk about that right now. This is an online conference. We can't have the same conversations. Okay. So, and then once you have actually, uh, you can search your providers and then uh, double click or use the actions menu to actually go into that provider and um, check on all the stuff associated with them and edit the, the things as needed and do the configuration and all of that. There's a ton of work that goes into, this is like a three hour like training session that I just like, vomited words out here in like two minutes and also made a joke about Rogan's comment. So, okay, next. So this is the previous Dojo interface for acquisition search. No shade in functionality here. This definitely has worked. So <laughs> that's all I got to say about that. No shade in functionality. Um, but with this new development to Angular and a ton of work, this is now what the acquisitions search looks like with, um, you see the search grid below that starts out there. You can very easily understand how to add and remove search fields. This is a tabbed display. Um, rather than the drop down to select what type, you can search line items, purchase orders, invoices, or selection lists. And then you still, if you really love the Dojo interface, can click on that legacy search interface for now. I don't know how long that will stay there, but for a while. We'll stay there until the purchase order and, and line, line items, items have been developed. Yeah, Because there are some actions that you need to take from search uh, that yeah. rely on being able to access purchase orders and line items, which is still in Dojo. So that is why yep. it's not just there for people who love Dojo. It's there for a practical reason, too. But nonetheless, I mean, sometimes we still have feelings for the X. And that's toxic. It is toxic. Next slide. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and then the custom filterable grids, I'm not sure what I put here because I'm not looking actually at my slides. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, this is for the line item search. And this, there was a lot of work that went into discussing how this was going to be rendered. This is a very custom grid here. Uh, and so yeah, I'm just gonna leave it at that and go to the next uh, thing. And this is where, go ahead and click on the next. You can see then the tabbed interfaces here um, for each of them. That first one, the line item search is gonna be the most customized of those uh, four tabs for the search, just because of all of the stuff that's in it. And that relates back to what Andrea is talking about, uh, the actual line items and um, the purchase orders being 
are rewritten in Angular. So that's going to be a large project. And that is um, something that is in process, not entirely sure where in the process, except for I know that it is an active momentum forward um, with uh, Equinox and Bill Erickson from KCLS and something that the ECDI is very invested in. So, et cetera, et cetera. We, we're gonna get acquisitions done. That's it. <laughs> we're working on the spec. Yes. For, for that yes. Purchase I mean, I do know that part of it, yeah. so. And, um, Bill Erickson's done a lot of the, the lead up work for that independently as part of his job for KCLS. And rather than reinvent the wheel, um, we're in, in the best traditions of open source, um, working working with his wheel and yes. adding some more spokes to it. Wow, this metaphor got tortured, y'all. It's OK. We can talk about X's and tires now. OK. Wait, Let's what? Move on. OK. Yeah. Managing authorities. I'm going to let you do this one. I might have written that down. Okay. Even though I spent tons of time with it. Oh no, that's so. I'm going to just going to go ahead and do this sure. one. Uh, this is a rewrite of the manage authorities in the cataloging menu. Uh, it's not all the administrative stuff on the back end, but it does have some new stuff in it. And the that you can see, there's also a, f a couple more columns, I think, that you can see from the column picker. But this is the the meat of it. And those linked bibs are super cool. Uh, if you if you then click or and I wish this was a live one because I don't remember exactly how I got to it. I think that you double click on the actual um, you, yeah, you heading, click on the heading. Or just yep. a line, yeah. You click on the and heading, it, and it takes you to this. Uh, to the linked bibs. And then, and the edit. Now, Unfortunately, the system I took the screenshot from did not actually have linked bibs. Yeah, that was, that was the same for me. So I was looking through that. I was like, oh, but I want to show linked bibs. But it They're really there. does work. It and, does work. And if you look at the Dojo interface that is in uh, whatever you're currently, unless you're actually running 3.6, in which case you'll be able to see this. Or three seven, um, it does show the number of the linked bibs there. So, but this actually then allows you to um, have those in a list. And I, I'm gonna hopefully get to play with it pretty soon to see what all is in that um, linked bibs page and what's linked in there, whether it be record ID or or title or whatever that title. But anyway. It's hey, just, it's another grid that displays. Um, yeah. And then they're hyperlinked. Right. I just want to know what the hyperlinks are. Okay. I think they're title. I have to go back and check. <laughs> Somebody give us one <laughs> that has the stuff. So, and then, uh, and I believe this was also by Bill. Yes, Bill Erickson did the mark batch edit. This is the interface that is available in 3.6 and plus uh, through the cataloging menu. One thing that I did discover here is that it's not yet linked up in um, the record buckets. So if you're wanting to use this, you can use it from here and then select a bucket for the record source. And I. I have no doubt that this is going to be something that comes out in probably the next release or the release after that, as far as major releases. Um, regarding linked bibs in the authority search, the title is hyperlinked. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, I thought. Thanks, Angela. Will authorities ever let you search the four XX fields if you don't know the established heading? I don't know the answer to that. If some know, development is done to do that. <laughs> Yeah, right. If somebody makes it happen through open source, all things are possibly there. Yeah. Um, and if there isn't a ticket, I would encourage you to actually file one or have somebody walk you through the process of filing one or have somebody else file it for you. Yeah. Um, because I, I do, that seems like something that would be valuable uh, development and perhaps not that difficult either. Yeah. Um, but not all things are practical. That's true. So this is a very nice rewrite of the Mark Batch edit, um, again, from Dojo, which I think more than anything looks intimidating, the Dojo interfaces do. And this is, is 
user friendly, more user friendly. Yeah, Angular makes things look so much uh, cleaner and and just generally less intimidating. Uh, more more web browser native things things work how you expect them to in a, a web environment. Yeah, and just having the alternating like rows be different color just kind of mm -hmm. draws your your eye in anyway. Okay. I'm sure that you know like a user experience kind of thing. Just like that. Weird. Just like that. Weird. All right. Next. Hi. Do you uh, Cool. I did. I did find your notes sheet <laughs> that I am now. I now have pulled up so I can see <laughs> my assigned slides. You guys, Ruth and I have had a lot going on in our personal professional lives. Let me course. tell you about it. No, just kidding. Let's not tell us about no. it. But we're here and we're talking to you about this. It's and got nothing we, to do with exes, though. How about that? We finished the slides more than twenty-four hours before this presentation because we're awesome. Oh, except for I looked back at them thinking that I still had three slides to do like three hours ago. You should have so. just let that lie ride, Ruth. Just let it ride. Anyway, yeah. next bit of Angular goodness that has happened in the last two releases um, is the item missing pieces interface. Um, and this is, I put scan item missing pieces in the title because that's what it, the menu access point is. But um, when you pull it up, it says mark item missing pieces. They're the same. Um, so what this does is it takes uh, that uh, the same functionality as uh, the mark missing pieces interface that existed in terms of you know, it'll generate a print notice for you to send and give you the option to apply um, a note or alert or block penalty to the patron if you so choose. Um, but this new functionality also gives you when you scan a barcode, um, as shown in the screen cap, it gives you a preview of the title, author, and call number data so you can verify before you proceed like, oh yes, this is the one I want to go ahead and mark missing pieces. And then once you click that green button, it prompts you with the next um, the next uh, function sets, the next steps of that, which is the print letter and the penalty, which is what I started with because, you know, ordering is the thing. Anyway, so just another nice little piece of angularization, making things a little cleaner, a little user friendlier. Also, uh, we're to the last um, two for our angularization lineup mm -hmm. here are these two local admin interfaces. And these were both done by Mike Rusher at Catalyte. And um, one of them, the shelving location groups gives you a new interface for creating your location groups um, and makes it again with the everything much cleaner, much more user friendly, um, those alternating gray and white bars um, just lets you, lets you play with it much easier than the old version. And then the circle limit sets, um, which I mean, it gives you a new grid, a new model. This one is doesn't really photograph well, as they say. But you wouldn't interact with these a whole lot, uh, the circle limit sets. Those are things that you create to link uh, certain shelving locations to your circ policies. So these are not necessarily interfaces, or the circle limit sets interface is not something that you'd be interacting with a lot unless you're either creating or revising circ policies. But it is now an angular and much nicer looking. So. And that's in addition to circ modifiers, which also set some circulation limits. So, yeah. All right. Onward. Onward. Quality of life improvements. Um, oh and these goodness. are just some fun things that came out in 3.6 and 3.7 um, that make your evergreen life easier, um, that they're not necessarily, oh, they're not OPEC related, they're not Angular related, but they're still pretty cool. Anything that has to do with holds, I think, is going to make everybody in the entire library experience happier. Uh, in this case, the hopeless holds is something that's, uh, this is from MassLink. So that predates ECDI, and this has been something that getting all of this um, together, it's kind of, yeah, kudos yeah, to everybody for all of it because it's been and, a thing. <laughs> and Noble also chipped in for the uh, item status bit of this, the hopeless prone statuses. Yes. So this is for those um, holes that don't have any eligible uh, items anymore. And uh, it, so to access it, it's going to be through the local admin menu. Go ahead and advance to this next. And it's going to bring up a... Um, an interface that allows you to scope by date and by pickup location to see those um, hopeless holds and to do something to them. So this, this is 
uh, holds management tool that is now in place. Yay. 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 This one was super personal for me because I used to be a CERC manager in my other library career and I had like multiple reports mm. put together using Excel tricks that did the same thing. To figure out how to, yeah, to yeah. deal with all of it. And yeah. this is so, I was so, so happy to see this going in. I felt like past Andrea was just cheering for this the whole time because it uh, brought that process into the ILS and made it so much more automated. It's, it's lovely. I mean, that one alone is, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. It. I did it again. You should not <laughs> let me drive. I, I will always let you drive. This is why, because we find new places along the road. Do, do, do. So while i'm finding where we were in the slides let me also tell you about something else with hopeless holds which is that it adds a um here we go a hopeless prone item status uh field so you can tell evergreen that if you have items in a certain status that are um, likely so likely to be hopeless that go ahead and toss those on the hopeless holds so what hopeless holds looks for is all copies that could fill the hold are either not of in an unholdable status or a quote hopeless prone status and that hopeless prone field is just a new thing on item status that you can assign or your administrator can assign i feel seen now administrators it's me hopeless prone okay <laughs> sorry all right anyway okay next. i've gotten us back on track now yeah so the next and three six is test notifications. This is definitely a quality of life thing to make sure that those email addresses are, you know, actually like semantically correct so that they go to an inbox somewhere. Uh, this is in both the um, my account feature for uh, patrons and then in the um, the staff patron edit interface. Uh, and I believe it it doesn't show up until you put an email in there. Is that correct in the patron edit screen? Uh, correct. You have to enter an email and then save it. And, and then, then it shows that option to send the test notification. Right. Um, as far as the SMS, I have not had success with that yet, but that might have been because I was working on a wonky system. So I lazily did not feel like setting up sms just and that may be because it requires time. yeah it requires some some back end configuration yeah. I and mean, we're not really lazy but sometimes we play lazy on tv but we're also not command line system administrators so. definitely not that definitely yeah. not that definitely not that but if you are here you go here you go and i also um have we confirmed that in the patron in my account that this shows up in the uh, boot pack. I was not able to get it to show up in the boot pack. Okay, um, I, I wasn't so, either, but that may be a configuration thing. If not, that's gonna be a ticket in Launchpad if yep. it's not already, so. Yep. Um, and I see in the chat, thank you, Claire, that test SMS has worked for Link, so good awesome. time. Good job on your administrators for setting that up and being less lazy than Andrew and Ruth. Um, I mean, it's pretty low bar in my case. Andrea works do. way harder than I do. It's a low bar, but we're clearing it. That's true. So All right. True. We're starting to get close on time, so let's push through these. Um, the next one is uh, is just to gen indexing. So this is another one. There's no pretty pictures of index indices, indexes out there. Um, and uh, this is what you need to know is listed on this slide, your uh, evergreen uh, administrator may have already converted your indexing. Um, it makes things faster and, and better. And if you want to take a super deep dive into um, the particulars of what the, what both what those acronyms mean, which I'm totally blanking on right now, as well as what they do, um, there is the PostgreSQL documentation um, right there. But the short version is faster, better, awesomer, yay indexing. It's unfortunate that I think the way that I do because I've read the article so many times and I still have not actually memorized what they mean because mm -hmm. that's exactly what I came out. Oh, faster. A little bit of compromise here, but faster. Mm -hmm. but that mostly, was, yeah. yeah. So I just automatically distill it down to not memorizing it. Sure. Well, you because know, it's so documented somewhere. Because it's documented somewhere and we're librarians, we can look things up. That's exactly right. We have outsourced that knowledge. That is correct. All right. And I'm going to 
not be able to give course materials the amount of time it deserves. Um, by, uh, I'm going to crack through these pretty quickly. Um, but it is very exciting. It is not just for academics. Um, and this is a, a very neat feature. So um, course reserves, there's some new settings associated with it. Um, a really intriguing alternate use case that I have seen people suggest for this is managing uh, displays or book group items, or as you'll see in my screenshot examples, um, uh, summer reading lists, like high school summer reading lists. So in addition to its uh, main intent as an academic feature, and it was funded by two academic libraries, Lynn Benton Community College and Treasure Valley Community College, um, it has definite use cases in a public library setting as well. So um, you would separate course reserves. The main management bits of this are terms, which are semesters or other large groupings, roles, which are user types, and then courses, which are your subdivision of terms. And courses you have uh, will have users' uh, materials and terms associated with, with them. So in the course setup, um, this is where you, you've created your course, you've created your users, you've created your terms. This is where you actually add your items uh, to your course. You can see I've made this high school summer reading 2021. As I mentioned, my background is public library circ manager. And um, managing high school summer reading lists was like a whole thing every summer and this I would have would 100% use this feature to do that um, rather than the largely on paper way we did it before. So this lets you assign um, the different materials that are part of that, uh, in this case course, uh, high school summer reading. I have called this, uh, this is the 10th grade section, so it's number 10. And then you can uh, set temporary circ mods, call numbers, status and location values for the duration of the course. So as you're assigning these materials, um, you can create temporary parameters associated with each of those items that will revert once you've taken them off reserve. So that way you don't have to go in and edit all these. It's just temporarily giving them these new features while they are in a reserve state. Um, and this is what that looks like in the OPAC. Once you've turned on all the relevant features, um, you can either search or browse for courses. If your instructor names are flagged to be public, you can search by instructor name or course names and numbers and then I have searched for um, my favorite fake patron in Concerto, Annette Ramos uh, is the instructor here. And this is the course material associated with the high school summer reading course that I created. So these are the important um, classical music texts that the students will be reading for their summer. And um, oop. yep, so that was like the super, super short version of course materials. I am so sorry to give it short shrift uh, because it is a very, very cool feature. So there's uh, a question from Jeremy. Do you see that? Any impact to reporting the alternate data? Uh, there are, I think that it has its own reporting source. Um, and I'd actually have to take a deeper look at the documentation or the release notes to see if um, how they, if theirs are counted as CERCs or if they're counted as something else. I think if they still get checked out, they are still recorded as CERCs. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms, I think what you're asking is, do they count that in their original you know, set of stats or the modified set of stats? And I'm actually not sure of the answer to that. And oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth says that they'll be looking at course reserves at the student success group meeting tomorrow at noon Eastern. So That's I will awesome. defer all questions to them because they are probably more well-versed in it. Um, and in terms of other follow-ups to things we've talked about here, I know that Bill Erickson, I think tomorrow evening, uh, is going to be talking about the newest and uh, forthcoming Angular things that are on the horizon, in addition to the stuff that Ruth and I talked about today. So, can course reserves be open or must they be associated with a set of students? Um, in my examples that I did, I just did them open. Um, I think when they're associated with a set of students, I was not able to see that that actually impacted their OPAC display, but I have not taken a super deep dive into that. And that would probably be a good question to bring to the student success group um, meeting tomorrow. So, all right, quickly busting through our last few slides here. Um, credits, I love this slide. Um, because it shows what a community-based operation Evergreen really is. These are uh, all the organizations that contributed uh, financially or in kind to all the development that you saw in the preceding 
slides. Um, that is an incredible cross section of our community. And I just, this was literally like the first slide that I built for this deck because uh, yeah. Cause it's pretty and awesome. Awesome. So thank you to all of these organizations um, for funding development in Evergreen and making all these awesome features possible. And along with that, of course, these uh, fine people representing the organizations on the right are the developers who actually did all the work. Some of them we named uh, by name and others we did not, but they, these are all the ones who are responsible for the actual code that went into these features. So um, thanks to all these people for improving Evergreen. And then also everybody that has um, contributed comments and things in Launchpad and done testing for bug squash and feedback fast and um, our testers, I'm speaking from the development initiative aspect, everybody that's tested anything that this does not actually get done without them. So it really does take, take a forest. And Dan put a link in to the chat for a bug related to the um, notification method testing for the boot pack. So um, if you have a Launchpad account, I would encourage you to go in there and add heat to that bug. If you do not have a Launchpad account, I would encourage you to set up one and add heat to that. <laughs> and Taryn will be talking about Launchpad tomorrow, yep. I think, if you're new to Launchpad. So check out that session too. Um, I had a Q&A slide where I threatened to um, tell bad jokes if you didn't ask questions, but hey, instead we ran out of time. So unfortunately, Yay. you don't get to hear my bad jokes and we don't really have time for questions. But Ruth and I will both be around, hop in for the next couple of days. We're both always around in the community and you can feel free to grab us across one or several platforms of communication if you have questions. Do you have one bad joke? Uh, where, where does a man splainer get his water? Oh no, I don't know. From a well, actually. Oh god. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. That well, is there you the go. And Andrea show. Ta-da! Thank you for joining us. It's we'll see been you next fun, year. Y'all. Don't forget <laughs> to tip your servers. Don't forget to tip your servers. And this is on our last slide. These are just links for documentation, release notes, and stuff for uh, more. And more all the slides will be features. available. All right. Yep, they will be. Beans. See y'all. Bye, everybody.